Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Frontiers of Music and Artificial Intelligence panel discussion. And I'm very pleased to welcome to the panel today uh, two experts in music and artificial intelligence. With me here is Philippe Essling, my colleague at uh, IRCAM, uh, who is uh, also a professor at the Sorbonne. And uh, we have invited to join us uh, in today's panel Doreen Hermans, who is also uh, a professor, also an academic, um, but working in Singapore. So she's joining us over the internet. And uh, Doreen is teaching at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. So uh, we will begin by having uh, each of you say a bit about yourselves. Um, where, it, where is your area of focus in music and artificial intelligence, how you came to be doing this, and what motivates you? Um, uh, tell us a bit about yourselves, basically. Uh, maybe Doreen, if you could start first. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, my background is uh, actually in operations research so, and in uh, business engineering. But for my PhD, I started uh, to explore how we could use these traditional techniques from operations research for music generation. So ever since then, I've, my main focus in this domain of AI and music has been, can we create systems to automatically generate music? So I did that for my PhD at the University of Antwerp, and then I got a Marie Curie Fellowship to join Elaine, in fact, uh, at Queen Mary in London, where we worked on the Morpheus system. Morpheus was a, um, a mu is a music generation system that can create music following a particular tension profile and with the long-term structure. Uh, and after my postdoc, I moved to Singapore, where I've been uh, leading a research group on AI and music. We have a project running again, not surprisingly, on music generation. Uh, this time we're creating music with emotion and uh, music, let's say, music with a narrative, so that can be used to match a video. Uh, we also do some other projects in this field. Uh, for instance, we're working on can we use deep learning techniques to learn new ways of representing music? Uh, can we process music uh, fast or in on a GPU processor? So we've created a library, for instance, to generate spectrograms on the fly using GPUs. Uh, we do automatic music transcription and some related problems. Thank you. And uh, Philippe? Tell us about yourself. Yeah, uh, wow, big question. <laughs> uh, actually, I have more kind of a chaotic background, I'd say, because mm -hmm. uh, I did a bachelor and in uh, mathematics and computer science, and then I went on to do some uh, distributed systems algorithmics, and then I came upon the masters of IRCAM, which was mm. for me a big revelation. I mean, finally, something that made sense. And uh, so I did my PhD at IRCAM, and it was uh, on uh, data mining and time series analysis uh, for musical orchestration. So the idea was to generate uh, orchestrations, so basically write uh, scores for orchestras that could sound the same as uh, input wave files. So after that, I went to do some genetics, and I worked in <laughs> metagenomics at the University of Geneva. And that was completely unrelated to, but it was a fun time. So I did some ancient DNA and this type of stuff. Very interesting as well. And then I found a position, so a professor position at Sorbonne and IRCAM. And since then I've been working uh, completely focusing on machine learning uh, applied to musical generation. So I created a small research group inside the musical representation team, which is called uh, ACIDS, which means uh, Artificial Creative Intelligence and Data Science. And so basically my main focus is actually on probabilistic models and uh, probabilistic generative models. Mm -hmm. So the goal at IRCAM, I guess, is more to try to find new tools that could uh, kind of uh, uh, propel uh, musical creation to new grounds. So the goal is not to have, you know, kind of obscure machines where you have a button and it generates lots of music. It's more how do we find new ways of creating new sounds and can it be super weird, that would be the best. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, basically I've been working lately on um, new types of models. So uh, I did some uh, research on how to generate uh, 
hybrids of uh, musical instruments. Uh, recently I did this thing called FlowSynth, which is a system where you can put a WAV file and it gives you the parameters of a synthesizer mm -hmm. that sounds uh, yeah. as close as possible to the WAV file. Mm -hmm. So this thing is quite fun, I guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the idea is more, can we use these systems to understand things that we don't? And so mm -hmm. maybe using this as a kind of, um, you know, turnaround uh, to alleviate uh, complex problems and to give us simple interaction with complex musical materials. Okay, great. Um, each of you has touched upon sort of applications of artificial intelligence in your work and um, I think for, for many people, uh, especially in, in the creative and music professions, mm -hmm. uh, a big question has always been, you know, if machines are taking over so much of the creative work, uh, are they going to replace humans anytime soon? Um, or, or are they intentionally going to be uh, replacing humans even in the distant future? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what is your take on this? Uh, maybe um, Doreen? Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a question that w we hear often, I think, and uh, maybe a, a rightful fear that musicians think, oh, uh, is this AI going to take over the job of composers or musicians? Uh, however, I think that the future really lies in co-creative systems. Uh, we can use AI, as, you s as Philip said, uh, we can develop new instruments, we can have augmented ways of interacting with music, uh, so that actually our abilities as a composer are only leveraged and reach a new level using these new technologies. So maybe Philip has something to say about that as well. Oh yeah, I have a, because I've been discussing this question many <laughs> times in many panels and I always have a weird way of answering. And I always say, if you want to talk about the future, you have to look at the past. And mm -hmm. basically, you know, photographs, they were the death of paintings. And then Photoshop mm -hmm. was the death <laughs> of photographs. And now AI is the death of Photoshop, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but does this mean that we aren't yeah. doing paintings anymore? No, mm. we are doing paintings, but we are doing completely different paintings than before. Mm -hmm. And we are still doing photographs. And we are doing photographs that are completely different from before. And for me, mm -hmm. this is the way that you can look at the future, is to see what has been happening in the past. You know, people have been afraid that trains would be leaving the people that ride horses without jobs and mm. I mean of course there are some dangers and we have to be careful about the ethics of these systems but I guess in every technological shift there is new grounds that are opened and it doesn't mean that you know it can kind of separate from the other mm -hmm. type of creative fields so for me it's a kind of a non-question because it's just mm. opening up new grounds so will AI be replacing some music yes of course mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole point of lots of research teams that are <laughs> working at, for instance, Spotify. I mean, I'm, not, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying, but I know they have a project about um, you know, music generation to, to really create music without artists. Mm. And I mean, yeah, I guess it's going to be bad music, but why not? I think that's a, a, really, a really good analogy that you make. Uh, and, and I think in the music generation work that we do, we also try to not think of our system as an autonomous system but really as a way to enhance the way that we interact with music so maybe we could just have a tool that um, we just enter the chords and it'll suggest as a melody that we can then tweak ourselves it could be something that's co-creative really yeah absolutely uh, you said a very interesting term which is co-creative system and i guess we are also very much focusing on this and i like the analogy of the musical synthesizer for instance, like when the synthesizer went out, it was like completely weird and nobody knew what to do with these weird sounds. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of integrated into, you know, mm -hmm. a musical uh, area. And I guess, yeah, in co-creativity, this is where you have like really something new and interesting going on. When you have a partnership where actually both entities, being human or cyber entities, mm -hmm. collaborate. And this is the collaboration that is generating creativity and not mm. the entities separately from each other. Right. So, um, so with respect to some, pos so, uh, some possible directions then, uh, what do you think 
given that we have this tool that is AI in front of us, before us, uh, and moving forward as uh, developments come along, where do you see AI uh, playing a role in, in uh, music creation or, or any other areas of uh, musical practice or um, any profession involve, involving music? I think, uh, uh, Philip, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I guess the tip of the iceberg right now mm -hmm. in what kind of practical outcomes or applications can come out of uh, this AI generation because right now I think um, the problem is that we're doing a lot of copy-paste, right? So mm, yeah. we try to mimic our behavior and right. I think this is logical. That's the mm -hmm. first thing because we look around and what do we see as intelligent and we look in the mirror. And we think, oh, we are the smartest things around. Let's do exactly what we're doing. But I don't think the real power of these approach lie in mimicry. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important step where we're going to you know, shift mm -hmm. out of this and realize that these models can actually do things that we can't. And mm -hmm. this is where the real uh, power, I'd say, of the AI mm -hmm. models will explore maybe new grounds. So in terms of jobs, I don't know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it, when you say we're enable, enable, en enabling us to do things that we haven't been able to do, mm. do, you, do you, have you experienced that? Or can you give a, a small example of what that might be? Yeah, actually, um, I mean, this is, sorry, this is a very <laughs> uh, personal, I don't want to you know, brag about my own work. But for instance, um, we did these I mean, you know, instrumental hybrids. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I can add some links to videos where we show up sure. some some yeah. things. But for instance, it was one of my favorite sound was actually um, it's kind of a mixture between uh, cello, um, clarinet, and the piano. Ah. So you have kind of a hammer, but the I mean, if you listen to the sound, it's like you hear the hammer of the piano, mm -hmm. and then it morphs into some bow that finish ah. with some vibratos, like mouthy vibrato, and it's <laughs> like the, the instrument itself is morphing along the sound. Okay. And it's super weird because I think it's kind of impossible to get these things even with physical modeling, or you could maybe, mm. but it would require so much work. So for me it was some kind of, yeah. And another example, and then I let the ring, uh, <laughs> is that it, it's just a weird thing, I made this uh, synthesizer sound like an eagle. I think I would mm. never have been able, and I laughed for maybe 10 minutes in my office because <laughs> it was just this super weird eagle sound that uh, <laughs> just was projected onto an additive synthesizer. Right. So, and for me, it was yeah, something I couldn't do on my own, or it would mm -hmm. require me like weeks of work. Sure, mm. yeah. Doreen. Right. Um, so if you're talking about uh, creative generative systems, uh, there, there recently, for instance, was the AI Song Festival, which actually showcased that a lot of uh, AI generated songs can, can sound pretty decent. Um, if you're looking at more non-generative approaches, let's say, um, we, for instance, I, I saw a movie, it was a West Side Story, it was the original movie, but they had uh, they had the instrument track removed and they kept the singing voice. So then they had the orchestra play the, the, the removed uh, orchestra track. So they used AI technologies to remove only the orchestra, keep the singing voice. Uh, so that's a very nice application of how we can use these. Um, it's not a generative system, but it's still an AI system that can do these pattern recognitions and remove, uh, do, do instrument separation from musical tracks. Which, which I thought was a very cool. Actually, Sorry? That one actually creates more jobs, it sounds like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, plus, you probably have a, there was probably a company doing this uh, source separation too. So. Uh, no, I, I, I was thinking of the musicians who then had to be called mm. in to play with the singer. Yeah, this was because, a, the, uh, yeah, this was a Singapore yeah. Symphony Orchestra, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Going into this mm. um, this analogy about right. sorry, may I don't, I don't no no know you, no go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it just made me think about do you know the story of the TB three hundred three, for instance? No. Uh, mm. TB three hundred three is a synthesizer by Roland okay. that was made to do bass lines. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it was supposedly a best uh, bass synthesizer, and mm -hmm. it was supposed to replace bass players in musical bands. So, for instance, you don't have any friends, but you like music, and you can use this thing to generate, you know, some fake bass. But it was actually really, really lame. Like it, <laughs> it didn't sound like a bass at all, and it didn't replace anything. And you know, groove boxes like rhythm boxes—they were supposed to remove drummers. Mm. And now we have an explosion of people that are actually using these things to do completely different music, and we still have drummers. But we have these boxes that were supposed to replace musicians, and it created more musicians than it replaced, I guess. Uh -huh. so, That's right. So yeah. another ex example where AI is actually cre creating jobs, yeah, because. because there are people needed mm. to be playing. Um, so. Um, That, that's fantastic. I mean, you, you've given many really good examples of AI enhancing creativity and enhancing opportunities for musicians. Um, so, in, in terms of where AI is today, I mean, it, there's so much that it can do. Uh, but what do you think are some of the look uh, possible challenges that um, scientists and researchers should be or could be tackling uh, for the next decade? Right. That, so I think uh, we still really aren't hearing AI-generated music on on our radio stations. So, at least not mostly. Uh, we said that partly it's not really our objective to replace and make AI generate autonomous music. However, even if AI wanted to, I don't think we're currently there fully yet because there's. If you watch uh, Star Trek, which was recorded even in the 70s, you see that we have Data, the android, and Data is still not possible to perceive emotion, right? So even in the futuristic view that people had of the future in the past, uh, emotion and computers don't equate, right? So, and I think similarly AI in music uh, doesn't really capture emotion fully yet, or doesn't know how to deal with emotion. Yet if we listen to music, emotion is really integrated in the experience. So I think that's definitely something that could be improved. Either the human interaction uh, brings in the emotion, or the systems themselves learn to be more um, sensitive or, or emotional effective. Uh, and I think that's a very important challenge to the future as well. Philip, what do you think of um, of where AI could be going in wow. terms of uh, the challenges? Um, so Doreen has mentioned um, so uh, the fact that humans uh, emotions are an integral part of being human, and AI has yet to be able to mm. capture that successfully. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with Doreen. Uh, for the big challenges, I would say maybe I have like five keywords. Okay. Well, I'm just thinking, <laughs> so I hope I found them. Uh, so basically, uh, I would say time, ideation, um, control, simplification, and understanding. So for me, this is like oh. the five big things I can think about. Time for me is the perception of, you know, complex relationships uh, across time and at different scales, but that's more of a geeky objective. Mm -hmm. right? It's kind of my pet peeve of understanding the time. But that is also, yeah. a, that, that, that is also a human trait, yeah, being able to perceive these relationships across different time scales. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think most of the yeah. things I, I see as challenges is actually close mm -hmm. to what Doreen said about uh, mm -hmm. like a, a finer and emotional understanding, mm -hmm. because For me, ideation is the question of what is the limit between the imitation, because most mm -hmm. of the systems we train, we train it on a set of you know, knowledge or data, mm -hmm. and basically we are using what I call the mean machine. So we are doing <laughs> expectations, right? So we are kind of computing the mean error across mm -hmm. our thing, which means that we are smoothing out things that are outside and the outliers are usually you know, mm, kind of thrown out, thrown out because mm. we need some nice mean error. Right. But actually ideation, creation, comes from these outliers. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. We imitate a lot and we don't know how to ideate mm. things. And then, wow, sorry, I'm super long. <laughs> Tell me if I speak too much. <laughs> or, or, um, 
maybe we pause for a yeah. moment at, uh, and then we want to hear the other five uh, okay. of the five. I need do you to want, remember. <laughs> do you want to say something about uh, what Philip has uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I totally agree with the time aspect, and I see that as um, songs will also have a structure, right? We'll have repeated themes and patterns that come back. Uh, what creates these earworms that we keep thinking of? Uh, I think that's definitely a very important challenge. This is, in fact, something that Elena and I have worked at in the past uh, in our Mor Morpheus system, and uh, we, we managed to get some structure in there, but it's still a very a hard problem to tackle. So we have so far, uh, we stopped at ideation, ideation, time, ideation, time, ideation. ideation. Uh, was that simplification? Uh, simplification. Okay, yeah. let's hear about simplification. Uh, simplification <laughs> is one of my big questions right now, mm. but it's already, we are kind of, you know, yeah. moving towards the next question. So. You sure? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's just, <laughs> for me, it's a very weird thing to call something intelligent when it requires, you know, the electrical power of a whole country and five <laughs> billion parameters just to say that something is a cat or something is a dog. Right, so, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's nice that we have these scores, but for me scores should be kind of normalized by the complexity of the system. And it mm. boils down to the notion of, you know, Kolmogorov complexity, mm -hmm. So, mm. which is how complex is the algorithm that is required to generate a certain solution. Right. And I, it, maybe it's more, you know, thinking about the Occam's razor, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, an intelligent, clever solution, let's say, mm -hmm. should be a simple one. Mm -hmm. And for me right now, it's, it's really a pity, I guess, that the current trend in deep learning is just having better scores by having bigger things. And if you look mm. at, like, the big results mm. we saw, big GAN, for me, it's completely stupid. <laughs> it's it's really GAN, and they called it big GAN because they multiplied the number of parameters by ten or twenty. If you look okay. at GPT, it's been like the whole GPT things has been all over the news. You know, mm. jukebox by OpenAI, for instance, or okay. these things. It's Transformers, and if you look like the latest uh, GPT three models from uh, OpenAI, it requires something around five thousand days of GPUs work to train the model, and Wow. And uh, they stated we're, we're not count, we're not even talking about the data, right? This is oh no, no, it's just not computing even, time. Just computing time, and mm. for me, it's yeah, it's paradoxical because yeah, we're getting better results, but does this mean that we? And that was my biggest question: like, can mm. we do the same with less? Which is for me mm. very important because I guess I can only call a solution intelligent if it's something simple that I can manage to. So do you think that simplicity is, is a human trait as well? Being able to succinctly um, summarize wh yeah. uh, what, what are the basic, what's the gist of something and how do you get at a solution? Oh yeah, for me that would be, oh, it, and this is actually a big challenge, can an AI you know, simplify thoughts for instance? Mm. So can you take lots of things and you know, having the ability to abstract something that is simpler? So it can be on the size of the solution, I say size of the model for instance, but mm -hmm. it's also for me if I have two models and they give me the same solution, I'm going to call clever the smallest one, you know, mm. the most efficient. Doreen, what are your thoughts on this, uh, on the, uh, this view of AI and the techniques? Yeah, interesting concept. Um, so in the past I've worked a lot with uh, rule-based systems which I think are very nice because you can, um, uh, yeah, in the case of counterpoint, you have a, a, a set of a very limited set of rules, and you can use them. And if if you do constraint programming or something, and you adhere to all of the rules, your music actually sounds pretty good. But if we move to AI, then we have this black box model that's becoming pretty big and very ununderstandable and the output seems to be okay, but is that really what we want, or is that the way to go? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Are you interested in comprehensible models? Do you think that is something that we should take, that, that we should put importance on? Does that seem to fall under the idea of simplicity? Yeah, I, I think it, it's obviously related, and yeah, I guess it's easier to understand something that is small, but uh, I don't think interpretability or understandability of the models will come 
in the same way that we are used to, because we are used to you know have labels over each and every variable that we use in an mm -hmm. equation. I'm pretty sure this is kind of out of the picture for what we are doing right now. But comprehending some more, let's say, um, orthogonal properties. So, for mm -hmm. instance, I don't know if you've seen like the information theory uh, ID, which was a, a very nice paper that mm -hmm. kind of uh, tries to understand the behavior of the model, but really by looking at the properties of what's going on between the mutual information of before and after the transform, which is mm -hmm. how the two things relate. Even though the middle object is complex, you're trying to understand the relationship that exists. So yeah, I guess it, for me it might be easier to understand uh, simpler models, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to need to develop even a model to understand the model. <laughs> so. <laughs> which, which is something that is done, right? Um, but uh, I, th I think there's some merit to the idea if we do, I mean, in the past, people have generated good sounding music using Markov models, which are fairly simple. If you combine Markov models in a correct way with long and short term memory, you can get some, some good resolve that, results that have this time dimension or this time aspect more into account as well. The challenge will be if you use simpler models and you probably will need to make them hybrid and guide them with some rules, which is, I think, a valid approach. And I think the hope of making the AI models super complex is that you can just, you know, let them do their thing and you don't need to guide them at all. So, yeah. Well, I, I think we have touched on uh, the first sort of uh, question moving on from what are the remaining challenges of mm. AI and that is how to do the same with less. So uh, I'm debating whether or not to ask you for the remaining, uh, the last two items <laughs> on your five, well there are two more, yeah. um, and, and then uh, maybe, uh, uh, and then we can move on to, to other questions about some, um, wh what are some of the big challenges uh, or what you might perceive as some of the big challenges for the field. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> we, we just did simplicity. We're going to spend yes. the whole debate. No, maybe we can, we can skip the two we remaining, skip the two remaining <laughs> ones. Because <laughs> I'm not sure what, I think there was some control and other stuff. Okay, but, well, yeah. you know, I, I think that, that sort of leads us to the next question, which is, um, how do we control and interact with unknown models and dimensions? Uh, now, now, Philip, you, you gave me this question, right? <laughs> so I'm going Sorry. to ask you to explain that. <laughs> okay. well, what, what do you mean? Okay, that's a unknown very models. weird one. And I think it, it goes to the probabilistic aspect of yeah. what I'm doing, because I'm working a lot with you know, latent spaces. And mm -hmm. my idea is to have these models where you can actually control the generation, but it's kind of also... Um, Secondary goal is also to try to understand what are the principal dimensions of variations inside mm -hmm. what you're giving the model, right? And uh, I'm saying that, and my sorry, even asking the question is going to take some time. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I ask weird questions. But let's take some examples. You know, when we developed, let's say, the violin, mm -hmm. we needed a new way to interact with the chords. Mm -hmm. So we had the chords, it vibrated, and we created some other instruments to try to control this new thing. Mm -hmm. And so basically my question is, in two, there is two aspects to this question. The first mm -hmm. question is, should we uh, develop some specific ways of controlling these models? Mm -hmm. I'm saying that because we've been working with composers, you know, with probabilistic models, and we had like this very nice um, low-dimensional uh, spaces where you could just move across the space mm. and uh, you know, generate stuff. And when the dimensions were not understandable, the mm -hmm. composer was not happy. And it was ah, too complex, yes, like yeah. what is going on in this mm -hmm. dimension? I, I don't understand it. And when the dimension was too simple, it was like, yeah, this is fundamental frequency. Mm. I understand it. It's not, an, it's not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so we lie in this weird you know, space, paradoxical mm. space, where we want things that we don't know, mm -hmm. but yet when it's too, it's too unknown it's, for yes, us, right. we can't really, you know, kind of apprehend and control this thing. Well, but that's the same for many create, uh, creative 
uh, endeavors. Yeah. Right? It needs to be new enough that it is novel, but at the same time not so new that people can't get it. Yeah, exactly. Right? So <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I guess the first part of this question is more: Should we develop some, you know, more instrumental gesture of AI, yeah. for instance? Hmm. Interesting. Instrumental gesture. So to control AI systems, to control perhaps if the AI system is generating sounds, to control yeah. the sound. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because we have new models with new possibilities and right. new complexities, but we are still using knobs or That's right. mouse. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so you want to use gest gestures to sample from your latent space, where you control your latent variables or something? That would be interesting. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. It's a very open question. It's just. And this is actually observations that we made like in the past month, working with a great composer called uh, Alexander Schubert. Mm -hmm. And he's been working with these latent spaces and mm -hmm. it's always a back and forth, you know, he's, he's having fun and at the same mm -hmm. time he's like, ah, yeah. I want something that is more understandable and then, <laughs> but at the same time he wants something. So it's very cool to see, you know, the yeah. interaction yeah. and it asks a lot of questions because I don't think we have like developed uh, specific uh, AI specific control mechanisms that's more kind of the do you, do you think that in in the creative space a composer working with these kinds of systems well you want to know what you're doing because you want to be in control mm. you you want to know uh, to have agency in mm. shaping what the results are um, do you think that that is equally uh, important in other areas of applications of AI, for example, uh, other areas where uh, AI systems are employed, do you think that uh, the ability to, to control these, uh, this parameter space and interact with the systems would also be important or is, is this something that you know, music and, and AI could sort of uh, influence uh, the field of AI and uh, is that um, I'm just wondering if, um, if that is something interesting for other domains. So we've uh, um, we just published a paper for the coming Izmir, which is on uh, we call it music fader net because um, this is a, a, a yeah a, a, this is a a variational autoencoder. So again, you you can tweak the the latent variables, and we we like to think of them as faders. Um, uh, and uh, by by doing so, you can control the note density, uh, the the amount of staccato, uh, and some other features of the generated uh, music. I'm sorry, did you did you publish it this year's Ismir? The coming Ismir. Yeah, we did the exact same paper. <laughs> 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 it's based on feather networks. And yeah. Great, great <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Great minds Sorry. Yeah. Great. Great. <laughs> so yeah, I think yeah, and and to to go back on on what you said as well, it's so the initial impulse is always to try to disentangle your features. So you try to find these latent variables that control one aspect, let's say fundamental frequency or whatever. But you might indeed, this is an interesting idea that Philip mentioned, maybe, maybe there could be latent variables that are compound and that control the music in a, in a way that we wouldn't expect, but that could actually be useful or unexpect, in an unexpected manner. Yeah, yeah actually it's, uh, I mean, it's crazy that we did the exact same paper, but in, in our case, you know, uh, to solve this idea of having understandable dimensions and non-understandable dimensions, we actually regularize the space so that we remove the influence of given attributes like net density, we have like an amount of arpeggiation, I don't remember, a lot. You know, we compute uh, symbolic features from the scores and then we ask the model to remove them from the latent dimensions and we reintroduce them in the decoding mechanism. So basically, it's kind of, um, we acknowledge the fact that there are some things we want to understand and there are the, like this big ball of mess that we still want to have, but we're not sure what's going on. And I think, yeah, it's a very cool direction where we kind of 
separate and we say, okay, this we understand, but then we are left with even more mess. You know? <laughs> like, okay, we removed everything we understand and now we still have these things that moves. <laughs> so yeah, understanding this one, I think it's going to be a big, uh, mm. a big mess. I love it. <laughs> so, um, do you, uh, and, and maybe it's time to introduce the next question then at this point, uh, which is um, with these AI models, do you think um, we, are, uh, we are limited uh, by uh, what we do with the AI models, by our own perceptual limits, um, and therefore, uh, well, and, and again, Philip, I have to ask you a question about your question. So, so it's a question about um, whether you know uh, the way we're using AI is actually implicitly non-creative. Mm. Uh, have we just eliminated creativity or, or caused death of creativity <laughs> by using AI systems? <laughs> And uh, that's a very provocative question. Yeah. Um, so maybe if you could like um, explain a bit what, what, what that, <laughs> yeah. where, where that question came from. Yeah, sorry. It's again, <laughs> again a very weird question. Yes. I know. It's just uh, I've been. I think it it relates to everything we've been saying uh, mm. so far, right? First thing is we give, for instance, a set of Bach chorales. Mm -hmm. And then we compute the mean error, so mm -hmm. we are smoothing out the outliers, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. The problem is we're creating systems that we call creative systems, yes. but at the same time, when this thing goes outside mm -hmm. of the limit of what we expect, then we kind of unhappy. You know, mm -hmm. it's like what? No, it's not sounding. It should be like Bach. I want this thing to be like Bach, and uh. then somehow I think it's kind of limiting. Right. If your mm -hmm. thing really goes on to you know completely complex and non-understandable dimension, this is kind of creative, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how much we impose and limit this system, which they don't have our you know genetic jail. I, I like mm -hmm. I call them jails, but it's a very weird concept, you know. It's just that we are bound by our own body and our mm -hmm. own society, so we have implicit biases mm -hmm. in what we do. And I'm wondering how much do we transfer these biases mm. to something which has actually no constraints somehow. You ask it to compute randomness, it's almost close to doing some real randomness. We are completely mm -hmm. unable to do randomness. Right. You see? So I'm wondering. This is just a very open and weird question on how much can we be creative with systems that we impose our own biases to and given mm -hmm. some sets of data where we kind of delimit what is the creativity, where creativity is going outside of these limits. Mm -hmm. Is this yes. more clear? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what you're saying is creativity is about breaking the rules, yeah. of bucking the trend, mm. and, and the systems are designed not to do that. In fact, they're trying to find the most common principles. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. Do we? This is a this is a, a very relevant problem. This implicit bias, right? Even in in non music systems, we see that uh, this AI model trained on Amazon job applications was most likely to hire the white male, just because in the data set historically those positions were given to white males. Uh, and same in music, maybe. Um, what AI really does is it looks at existing data, finds the patterns, and then generates something in the same probabilistic distribution as those patterns it found. And you might almost argue that the system would be more creative if the model isn't very good and it breaks uh, that probability distribution of the original data. Um, yeah. It, it, how do we, what is, I mean, it, it's a, a whole subdomain, right? Musical creativity, uh, what makes the system creative? Maybe it's actually the programmer of the model that's creative. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, but I think this is, again, why we, we shouldn't necessarily be expecting the, the AI systems independently to be creative, because they are just replicating things that they've seen. Sure enough, they actually, they're AI systems, so they can actually process a larger data set than we are ever going to be able to listen to. Uh, but they will still be replicating from that data set. And uh, 
I think there's a there was a paper by Pache from I think maybe a decade ago that also talks about the fact that if you if you're generating with Markov models that are quite short, for instance, in the end the generative model is just going to be replicating the data set and you're going to run into plagiarism problems. So that again makes clear that these systems aren't really creative. So how do we introduce the creativity? And and again I think the best way to do that is by having someone interact with it. Yeah, I completely agree with you and it's interesting because it, it kind of shines well with a, a theory from a friend, I don't know if you know, Philippe Codonier, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, he had, he, it's not a <laughs> published thing, it's actually a discussion we had, and he has this theory and I think it's very interesting. Like if you look at the, the ways uh, new musical genres were defined mm -hmm. over the past century, it was usually given some social context mm. and the fact that little uh, pockets of people were actually secluded for a long time because they started doing things and these things were bad, <laughs> like really, really bad. But then they stood to their bad things and they stood together and after a while when the, you know, their style kind of evolved in this remote place, uh, mm -hmm. secluded place, then when it was mature enough, it started, you know, blooming and exploding over the world. So, for instance, psychedelic rock and punk and also techno music. You can see that is uh, you know, a group of secluded uh, information that kind of reinforced itself for a long time mm. before going onto the world, right? And what they're saying is now at this era of ultra information and ultra, you know, smoothness of information, whenever something new pops up, it's immediately taken over and you know remixed mm. and reinforced and mm. it's just blurring out into the gray. Oh, I and I think it's it's an interesting point of view. It's like, interesting. So so that's actually saying that it needs uh, uh, there needs to be kind of a signature, a definitiveness about a particular new trend or mm. new idea. Uh, and in, in this case, it came about because people were isolated and there was time, mm. there was a period of latency yeah. where it could strengthen exactly. and be grounded before it could then take on the rest of the world and still hold mm. its ground yeah. against all the other ideas out there. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. I think it's kind of, you can see the same thing yeah. in scientific research. I mean, sure. deep yeah. learning itself was something that was on the yeah. fringe for like 10 years and you know some weird people continue to say oh, this is going to work <laughs> and they kind of stood by this thing and yeah it works and somehow now you know when something new pops up like transformers then it's regular transformers and regular batch norm transformers and regular batch norm transformers regular <laughs> blah, blah 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 so it's kind of I think yeah it's normal we like to mix things together and that's mm. how we create new stuff but, but you're saying mm. it's not just about the mixing, it's, it still has to have an identity. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Mm. Um, and let's see, in the last five minutes, I'm going to ask each of you if you have sort of parting thoughts, um, and, uh, or, or maybe you have more, more things you want to say about what, what has transpired here. Mm -hmm. um, so, Doreen, would you would you like to? Um, um, wh what would you like to share with the people who will be watching this panel uh, as some uh, parting ideas? Right. Um, I think actually, music and AI is becoming a really exciting research field. I have always found it exciting, but you can tell that more and more people are interested in it and that we have sort of the resources to bring things a step further than we used to. And uh, I think a lot of very cool applications are going to be built uh, in the, the years to come. And through mobile devices and cloud computing, all of these things are going to come closer to every one of us, like we all having our Spotify apps and Shazam on our phone. And I'm quite excited to see uh, what the next years will bring in terms of creative systems. Um, and Philip, what about you? Well, <laughs> big uh, philosophical things. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, don't, we don't aim low. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, first, I'd like to, to thank you both for this very interesting 
uh, conversation, and uh, I mean, we can continue on for hours. But uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I would just like to address this kind of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how to to say it, but there are some fears about AI. Mm. You know, this uh, replace, uh, will it replace humans and right. this type of stuff? And there are some, you know, I think it all boils down to education. And mm -hmm. everything boils down to education, all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think if people would just take some time to understand what's going on inside and just, if we can push forward the, the education of AI, you know, mm -hmm. even to younger generations, and I'm pretty sure, you know, intelligence vanish with explanation. This is something <laughs> I say a lot. If you see something which seems to be complex and, you know, yeah. doing something crazy, and then you look at the inner workings of the system mm -hmm. and you understand mm, it's yeah. not that intelligent. That's right. In the end. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm pretty sure most of these, you know, doubts and fears about AI can just vanish with explanation. Mm -hmm. And regarding the creative aspects of AI, I completely agree with Dorin. There is like so many cool and interesting stuff going on all over the world and you can see mm -hmm. the trends of like lots of big companies are now opening, you know, labs that are devoted to creation mm -hmm. and I think it's it's magnificent because it's in creation and arts that lies the evolution of humanity so oh that was a little bit too much <laughs> <laughs> but seriously I mean we've been always you know kind of pushing the limits through kind of dreaming in in the arts and I think yes. it's super important that we continue to fund and uh, support the artistic mm -hmm. endeavors so for Absolutely. me this yeah. is a uh, like primordial uh, aspect, and I'm very glad I'm part of it. Wonderful. Well, that, that was quite a discussion, both of you. Um, we, we traversed a lot of ideas, and a lot of groundbreaking ideas, and a lot of ideas that haven't been tried and mm. come to fruition yet. <laughs> um, well, I... I uh, Hope that this um, has been as inspiring for all the viewers as it has been for me. And um, I want to thank both of you very much for your time and for sharing uh, your expertise and also experiences working with AI systems in music. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Elaine.